A pro tip, if you care about the slides, take a picture of this slide. There's 162 slides, I think, now in there. Uh, there's no way you're going to see them all, as in you can't copy them quickly enough or even take your picture quickly enough. But if you take the first one, then you can load the slides and then get back to all the links I spent so long, so long typing for you. Uh, that way you will be able to look at stuff that's interesting. All right, so let's see if everything works. Uh, there we go. So, oh, I see, I told you it was going to be fast. All right, you get one more chance. I will do the German dance for you while you're taking pictures. All right. Just one at the end anyway. So um, all right. So slide number two. Um, so welcome to my collection of rejected uh, talks. Um, first was a talk about Arduino, got rejected. Then tracking sleep apnea and sleep patterns with Arduino, that was also rejected. Uh, then how to learn from Tridge um, and turn, uh, use hardware and software and turn all your money into things that fly off and never come back. That was also rejected. Um, and if, I'm sure it's not because I'm a bad person or I'm not smart or the, uh, anything like that. It's because the rest of you all were smarter than me. So you actually got uh, the talk slots and I didn't. So I'm not taking it personally. And now you're here on the other one, um, which is how to do uh, open hardware hacking from uh, this shirt here to other things with blinky LEDs uh, to uh, Google Fuchsia. I had to find a reason to actually put work in it. And I did use some of my knowledge uh, at work. So at least it wasn't all lost to LEDs. Um, so we have four talks now, 166 slides in 40 minutes. That's 3.75 slides per minute uh, or 16 seconds per slide. I will talk as fast as I can. I'm sure you can read even faster than I can talk. So we're good. Ready, ready, go. All right. So this is the slide that makes your talk go faster. If you've been to that mini-conf, uh, you can do an entire pro talk in three minutes. So if I use that slide, my talk will go faster. It makes perfect sense. Uh, thank you to Paul for that slide. I shamelessly, you can even see Paul at the bottom of that slide with his crazy hat uh, right there. Um, all right, so why this talk? Usually, you know, people are here to say, hey, use my stuff, I need your help, uh, anything like that. So I have actually nothing to sell you, almost nothing. I have two libraries I wrote that you'll find uh, links to that you're welcome to use. Uh, but because I'm perfect, they don't need any help. No, I'm just joking. But the point is, they do what they need from me. You're welcome to take them. Uh, I would rather that you actually able to use the work I did than have to, having to rewrite your own. Um, also, it's really all, you know, this used to be a next conference, all about software, operating systems, and so forth, uh, which is my background, what I've been doing for more than 20 years. Um, and I came here uh, 10 years ago with the first open hardware miniconf and looked at, oh, there's cool things you can do with uh, blinky lights and electronics. And this is kind of to share what I learned here and to en and basically encourage you to maybe look at that too, just because it's something different. It's fun. And one thing I learned from personal development is if you keep doing what you already know and get slightly better, it's not nearly as rewarding as something you really suck at and make more progress there, even if you set things on fire in the process. All right. So um, I hate to say that I'm old enough that when I was a kid, uh, we didn't quite have computers around as in the ones you could get at home. Um, so I got into electronics with little uh, electronic kits that I'm sure you have seen. I could make, you know, wire everything. It would do something. I had no idea why it really did it, but it was kind of cool. But after a while, I got bored because of how long it took to wire it all and how I didn't really do, you know, anything that I understood. And I learned many, many years later in school why there were differential equations and why it was actually much more complex that I would have been able to learn at that age. So um, it was fun, but, you know, then the other part is I had to go to a store to buy a component I had just burned. It was an hour each way plus money I didn't have. Um, so yes, when you do electronics, you get friends with this little guy. He looks, he has different ways. He looks that way too. There's many different ways for it to be hiding. And then that means another trip to the store. Although nowadays you have Amazon. Uh, so you just click on the button, something shows up two days later if you're lucky, or maybe the same day even. Um, so anyway, the point being is I gave up on electronics uh, when I got my first computer because, hey, I didn't have to keep buying stuff. Um, I understood what I was doing a lot more, even though I was uh, soon programming in assembly language. But somehow assembly was easier for me to understand than electronics. Um, so that's mostly what I've been doing since then. Now, I met uh, this uh, nice looking guy who looks trustworthy and all. It makes it look all easy, right? You, you hold the part that doesn't burn in your hands. Um, and uh, yeah, he gives keynotes about how you go to space and you can be famous and everything. Um, so I got conned and I went to his mini uh, be Before we get there, um, one, one thing I want to say is even if you don't spend all that time learning electronics, which is a pit of despair, like he would say, um, you can do a lot of things with just basic electricity or very, very simple electronics. 
Um, so just a soldering iron, a multimeter, um, I did things like that. So this is, of course, completely UL listed. Uh, it hasn't caught fire yet, so therefore it is fine. Um, so this is, this is a 20 volt uh, power supply that's meant to recharge my uh, battery pack for my laptop, um, not the laptop itself. And with a few, just you know, a few wires, a few little bit of soldering, uh, resistor bridge I will explain later, and that's a volt amp meter. Um, I can use this to charge, well, not to keep my laptop charged, at least not to charge it. And this little, those resistors will look into why we're here, why they're here. Um, so yeah, the idea was to, uh, when I go somewhere, I don't want to take the big bulky power supply. I can take this guy, or if, if I forgot it, I have a backup. Uh, my laptop backpack still weighs twice the legal limit in Australia and New Zealand, but that's a different issue. Uh, so my ThinkPad, this nice little fellow, which only weighs four to five kilos, um, it's a little bit power hungry. It's a very nice 4K screen, uh, six terabytes of storage. Uh, it's really just a desktop that you can put in your backpack. Uh, it does, however, take a lot of power. Um, it's not very smart, so when you plug into power, it says, oh, you're in power. You probably have 170 watts, so let me take it all. So if I plug into a car or an airplane uh, power port, it will usually trip it because there's usually only 10 amps, 12 volts. That's 120 watts, usually about 100 watts after losses. And that tries to get more than that. So every time I plug into a plane, I reset the, my seat. And if I'm not lucky, I reset the entire row, depending on what plane <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> so yeah, I learned that after a few times that maybe don't do that. Um, so this is where this little guy comes in, because this guy is only, uh, I think, 50 watts. Uh, it cannot do more than that, so it's not going to reset the seat. And then I can even see how much my laptop is actually using real time, using the amp meter here. So I can like, you know, make it dimmer, turn off stuff I don't need. Uh, and know whether um, my laptop is actually discharging fast or just staying where it is. So here's uh, already the first link, which you can get from the slide, um, showing how to do this. And the resistor bridge uh, that I have, that's the little blue thing you have uh, there, this guy here. So those resistors, there's a center pin, and saying which, which resistors actually says how many watt the power supply is. The laptop doesn't know, but if you tell it, they will not draw more than 45 or 90 watts. Um, but that's what that was, those little resistors are for. So uh, I went on a great walk here, which is where you go backpacking. Uh, in theory, you're supposed to sleep in a tent and uh, rough it up, which clearly I was doing here with a bed and pillow uh, on the root burn. And uh, since the thing was so easy, I didn't have anything to carry. I actually carried my laptop, the whole five kilos, and the, uh, and the power supply because I had nothing to do in the evening except sorting pictures. So that's where that little power supply came in handy. Uh, that's what the connector looks like. There's a prototype showing the center pin. Uh, so you can also take your power supply, cut it up, and maybe you'll find cool things like a center pin where you can do things like that. Uh, so the same thing here, the one you just saw, that's in the car, uh, showing right now it's using five amps to charge. Um, there you go. So the next thing is uh, I've gone to a few things like Burning Man, um, another place called Ephemeri, which is a temporary island built in the Delta River in California, uh, where you're charging, if you can, off solar panels. And the whole thing is, you know, people use solar panels, they use an inverter to bring it back to 120 volts, and they bring it back down to 5 volts, which is, whoa, a lot of wasted energy. So uh, I spent some time uh, writing a little blog showing how to actually not use uh, AC at all. Um, and this is basically uh, all my battery chargers of all kinds, including, um, I think you can see here, that's my own little made se separate power supply made for my laptop using another uh, 20 volt adapter that's up converting from 12 volts. Uh, and all of this is really just wires, right? There's no electronics, you don't need to be smart. Uh, you just need a soldering iron, some wires, ideally of the right thickness. If not, you'll find out why soon. And, uh, and that's about it. And worst case, you short something, put a fuse here and there, and if not, the wire will be a fuse. So, so that's, uh, yeah, my ThinkPad adapter, which is also very UL listed as long as I close the box. Uh, <laughs> And uh, then USB, yeah. Even USB itself is, used to be simple. Now it's like 5, 90, 9, 12, 20 volts, who knows. Um, so should I plug that, uh, my, USB, my phone into that unknown USB power port that you find everywhere now? How do you know there's not a rootkit trying to push uh, over your data pins? So I have this little guy that I found on Amazon. Um, I should probably point here. So this one has two ports. One is uh, power only. The other one is data. And the good thing here is it shows you how many uh, amps right now is a 0.41, so it's showing that my phone is not charging much. You can also see 5.32 volts, which is nice because if your wire is too thin, the voltage will start dipping. Or if your power supply 
is not providing as enough amps than compared to what you're into draw, you will also see the voltage uh, dip as a hint of what's going on. Um, so yeah, that's an example here. Now the phone, you see it's charging 1.41 amp, kind of hard to read, sorry, and you can see the volts dropping to 489, which still works, but starts to be borderline. All right, so that's uh, uh, solar panels I got it for Burning Man. Um, that was just my, uh, again, UL listed little power st charging station. Um, actually, I did have some things that kind of fused and burnt, but no real fire. Uh, the, fuses <laughs> <laughs> the fuses take care of that. Um, some wires were a bit frayed, and then they're shorter, and bad things happened, but I made it for the week. Um, those little power monitors, power monitors, again, you can buy them from Amazon. They're, uh, this one's showing uh, solar panels making 12 volts, delivering 0.7 amps. Uh, and smaller numbers here, you can see that I've used, no, I've produced 42 amp hours here. Uh, sadly, I have used a little bit more. Um, here, I've used, uh, yeah, 1.1 kilowatt hours in a few days. That's actually because of this shirt and a few other things that I was charging. So the good thing is with DC, you don't have to worry about AC because, you know, AC is all nice and good. Uh, but you don't need, if you don't need AC, don't use AC. It's the short version. Although, yeah, natural selection. I think we don't have enough natural selection anymore. So it's a free country. Do whatever you'd like. All right. So back to the Miniconf. Uh, so Arduino came out. Um, I was like, OK, yeah, small computer. Mine's bigger, so why do I care? Um, and then uh, next conf you came up and with the Arduino Minicom from John and uh, his friends. Um, so I'll give you a very, very quick summary. Uh, there's actually, they have very good slides. I will, sh sorry, web pages, I'll show you all the projects. Um, the first year was basically a uh, little board like this, uh, which had basic uh, input, output, buttons, LEDs. I even had a wireless radio on it. And it's just, you know, the hello world. It also had a nice screen you could actually write to, which was already quite, uh, quite nice for input-output. Uh, the next year, so there's, there's 10 years worth of projects. So I'm, uh, I spend more time than others. Uh, so that one was uh, the second one, the, and it looks like this. Um, it was meant to go into a rocket tube. Uh, there's a kind of shady looking little plug that I had lying around that I used to connect, disconnect the GPS. Because uh, turns out mine never ended up flying, but I found other uses for it. So they had two wireless radios, GPS, SD card, which actually for the time was really cool. Nowadays, like anyone has that, but then it was really nice for 2011. Um, so it was meant to go to space in rockets, or this one went into balloon. Uh, it actually did, just not mine. So mine uh, was used for something different. Um, I was actually uh, trying to track my sleep at the time. That was talk number one, if you're following, that got rejected. Uh, but I did actually write a talk for another conf. So uh, since you're here, I'm going to put that talk in five and a half minutes. Um, so I was trying to track how, how well I was sleeping, um, whether I stopped breathing for how long. Uh, you may have heard about sleep apnea, which basically means that uh, you relax at night, you start breathing for X amount of seconds, your blood saturation drops, and then you wake up, but you don't actually know that you did, and it's bad for you, for your brain, and a bunch of other things. You wake up the next morning, you're tired, even though you slept eight hours, but not so well. So that's the whole talk, if you're interested. Uh, but it's just to show, uh, if you go do it the normal way, that's how you go. Yes, you go to a lab and they wire you up for about 40 minutes with all that crap on you. Um, I'll save uh, how they shave your legs and your head to put, uh, well, not your whole head, just part of it to put the sensors. Uh, all, every wire here is a sensor. It actually has a SCSI connector on the other side, which I thought was kind of cute. Um, I think it's the only one that had enough connectors. Um, and then... Uh, the whole thing is you're supposed to sleep with all that crap on, on you. So I'm like, well, no wonder I can't sleep because you just put all that stuff on me. <laughs> so so they made some, uh, they're making some uh, versions that you can take at home, which are not nearly as good, but at least work well enough. Uh, this one still has a nose cannula, which I find, you know, it's here. You have to tape it, otherwise it comes off your nose, and then the whole night is ruined for monitoring. Um, this other version somehow is able to get your breathing from your finger. I never quite the logic out of it, but apparently it works. The only thing is the blue piece that you're seeing, uh, this little guy here, um, it's a one-time use. I'm sure that was done on purpose, so they charge you another 100 bucks every night to use it on top of the rest. Um, and yeah, that's what it looks like. So if I could have gotten one of these and have it at home and use it every night, that'd be great, but because it's a medical instrument, I'm obviously too dumb to use it myself, even though I had to show my doctor how to download the data from it because they couldn't make it work. Um, so eventually I got the software from them, was able to use it at home for a few days um, and get some data. 
but you know, long term, I want to do my own. So that's where my what send that uh, board came in. Um, I did a bit of rewiring. Uh, so this one had an accelerometer on it. So the first thing I did was just uh, seeing whether I was sleeping on my left, right, up, or down, which means uh, more likely to be in a position where I'm going to not breathe as well. So that was the first thing I got out of, out of it. Um, then I put um, found a wind sensor. Uh, if you look here, there's a little heating element, and next to it is actually uh, a heat detector. So it's depending on how much wind goes in between, uh, this one gets more or less hot, and that's how you can tell the wind going through it. So I put a little tube you can see here, and that tube goes to the cannula, and that's kind of a way to uh, measure breathing. Because I move, I still have to tape the crap out of it, otherwise it moved out. And the other things you're seeing here were called Zeos. Sadly, they're not for sale anymore. Uh, one was actually connected to my phone, another one to a base station, uh, like we didn't see. Um, and they're supposed to pick up your airwaves and see what uh, sleep stage you're in. That's what the Zeo looks like. And it gives you, uh, for during your night, like you're in stage two, stage three, REM sleep, and you're awake. Um, so that's what it's, uh, that was a bit beyond my own capability. But the really good thing is this device actually had a USB port on the back, or actually, sorry, an FTDI 3.3-volt uh, level uh, port that I was able to get data from connect to my computer. So here, for instance, you can see that I can detect that I switched to REM sleep. Uh, the rest here is the nose cannula values showing uh, just the right now value of uh, heat going through, which means whether I'm breathing and how quickly. So that was the uh, graph that I was able to make from those cannula. It's nice enough to show that it works, but I can't use data like that. Um, so it, it's good as a, you know, hey, I made it work, but not good enough to actually use for real. So instead I used a stretch fabric, which is a resistor in, in a band that I would have around my waist. Uh, that sounds like a good idea. Oh, by the way, yeah, that's a bit of extra wiring that was missing from the board. I'm not sure why John didn't wire all that stuff for me. Maybe he didn't know what I was going to do with it. <laughs> um, so that board, sorry, that band basically uh, detects if it's being stretched and then it changes resistance. So um, I got other kinds of data, which of course had other issues as you can see. And if you can imagine, if you're moving while you're sleeping, you're also moving the band separately from, uh, uh, from breathing. But those big dips were actually something else. I thought, oh, maybe it's an analog problem. I'm going to just add capacitors. So that's a small capacitor. That's not a small one, actually. Uh, but that's actually a bigger one. That's a nice one. Uh, and even the big one didn't actually fix it. So I was like, OK, you know, people tell me if it's an analog problem, just add a bigger capacitor. Turns out that was all lies, as usual. Uh, <laughs> so I spent more time looking at it. And then I realized I was using an XB radio to send data. And if I used a higher power XB radio, it would be worse. Um, eventually, um, the people, the smart people who designed the board put a diode to stop dumb people like me from putting power backwards. Except, unfortunately, the board actually dropped the voltage 0.7 volts, which is what diodes do. And it was still within specs, but when the XB Pro was actually transmitting data, it was dipping the voltage enough that the analog reading ended up being wrong. And that's why I was getting those dips that you see here. That was actually the radio transmitting and changing the base voltage, causing that crap data. So that was quite a while, many nights of uh, bad data and uh, being worried for no reason. But eventually, I finally got data that was a little bit better. Um, so now I was able to get my sleep position again. Um, hours of sleep, uh, left, right, and then the breath here. Uh, so breath with longest delay. Uh, here it shows, uh, I guess, eight seconds of no breathing uh, at this time in the logs. So. This was nice and good, it was, but this is kind of where I gave up because now I was missing, I say, 10, 5 10%. That last 5 10% was going to be 90% of the effort. Uh, the other thing is I want to get an SPO2 sensor, which at the time were not available as something I could plug into uh, my computer or an Arduino. It was all closed source stuff with crap drivers. So, and I had other stuff, or I kind of gave up. But that's uh, how the slippery slope of one project of uh, the Miniconf. Then uh, the next year we had Pebble V2. Uh, so Pebble V2 was an improved version of the first one. Um, you can see here that um, it has you know, more nice LEDs um, and input-output. But the big thing is the screen now had more capability. Um, and I was able to find uh, the original spec sheet for it and write a proper driver that was able to unlock things that that little uh, guy here. I had a heart sign that was hidden there. Um, 
and I was able to make a pop-up menu system using that, uh, I think it was a potential meter, I don't quite remember, um, that had a button when you clicked on it. So I basically made a pop-up menu, and you could select by turning the button which part of the menu you wanted to select and function. Uh, so that was quite fun. Uh, way too much work for what it was, but hey, you know, it, it's kind of hacking back to the early days of like basic computers. Um, Hack CNC uh, was a, looks uh, like, this, like this. It's pretty much uh, like a 3D printer, but 2D. It had a pen, and it could draw shapes. Um, I think it was a way to uh, haste the people who flew back in uh, faraway countries with something that wouldn't fit in their luggage. But it was, uh, <laughs> it was fun when they brought it, but not when we were finished with it. Um, so, okay, now we're getting to 2013. Um, so Adafruit does a lot of, uh, sells a lot of hardware, and one thing they do well, uh, on top of marking up the price of what they bought, is uh, write drivers. And they write quite good drivers for a lot of uh, hardware uh, that people later use on clones. Um, so the Adafruit GFX is basically a basic lingua franca of writing on 2D matrices. And I got introduced to it in a little, um, uh, I would say, I don't want to say mini-conf, but basically training uh, that we could do for fun at work uh, with this uh, dual uh, color matrix here. And that was an accelerometer, and I wrote kind of a little game of snake where if you would move the board so the snake didn't fall off the sides. Um, and that then said, told me, oh, this is pretty cool. I could actually you know, do things with those uh, matrices. So I got my own. Uh, this one was a, it's a bicolor, and there's also tricolors that look like this. Um, so the problem with these matrices is that they're row scanned. So if you do the math here, you have 64 LEDs. Well, you don't want 64 wires, right? So you have eight wires for the rows, eight wires for the lines. So you start one line, you say line number one, and then on that line number one, you select which rows you want to light up and you do that for each color. Then you have three colors, of course, you need more pins, that's why you have more uh, resistors here of different values, because each color is a different uh, current. Um, so you basically write a driver that goes and scans very quickly, and say, well, how hard could it be? There's always examples in the little Arduino books, but they're not actually intra-protein, they're like a loop, and you can do nothing else. I want to do a background driver where you gave it a frame buffer and it would just display it like a real computer. So how hard could it be? Well, three or four weeks of work later, uh, that's the library there, and you can read the post with more details. Uh, and I know to anyone who's been doing this for a while, they say, well, how hard is it? Well, yeah, it's the first time it's always hard. It gets quick, uh, a bit easier later. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, I was able to do four bits per color, um, and I found uh, some, a method called, uh, I think it's the next uh, slide, yes, uh, binary code uh, modulation, where instead of actually uh, flipping 16 times for 16 intensities, you have one interrupt that's four times T. So if you're either on or off for half of those 16 uh, time slices, then you do two times T and then one time T. So now you can basically have four interrupts instead of having uh, 16 of them and still get 16 levels of intensity. Uh, I know that's very quickly explained, but if you look it up, uh, you can read more about it. So I was able to get more time to uh, run my code as opposed to spending time in interrupts to do that. Um, but then we got the Ardiphone. So Ardiphone was the coolest project ever, seriously. I mean, if you have a phone like that, you definitely look like a geek and people respect you. Uh, <laughs> now, the, the sad thing is uh, it was designed just around the time that uh, 2G GSM was being phased out. And uh, by the time I got mine working, I couldn't really use it as a phone anymore. So I still felt bittersweet, but this was probably one of the coolest projects we had. Uh, so yeah, that's what it was there. Uh, SimpleBot was the first bot. You've probably seen those little cars running around, of one of which is here. Uh, so that was the first version of it. It was very nicely made. It's just, you know, cut cardboard or whatever that material is, I forget, um, a Raspberry Pi, and it was using, I think, Node.js. Um, so then, uh, Trade who may, you may have seen at those conferences tells you that, hey, you should fly. You know, put your, or your Linux running on a board and put it on the plane or something like that. It will be fun. It's like, okay, that sounds, you know, Trade is a smart man. I should listen to Trade, right? So, so I did part of that. Um, I kind of liked it because it, it was a mix of electronics, uh, Arduino programming, where I actually got to modify microcontrollers to do what I needed in flight. And it's definitely 
a different feeling to write code and have it actually fly and do stuff that's, you know, like, hey, I could be a Boeing or something. And so, yeah. Um, and one of the things, I actually had one plane that I lost. I was flying FPV long range, first person view. That means using goggles. Uh, and the plane was a very good glider. So when the motor died, and it was a push motor. I never saw it. And it kept flying until I realized that I was losing altitude even though I was full power. And by the time I realized that, I was too far to come back. And next thing I know, my video feed drops out. And I never saw the plane again for a whole four months until I got a phone call when I was in France saying, hey, I found that thing with your phone number on it. I was like, what? And until I realized, holy crap, it's my plane. And the guy actually had been sitting, I think, in a golf course maintenance like, garage somewhere. And some guy was there to paint the place. Found that. I was, oh, that's a plane. That's kind of cool. Oh, there's a phone number on it. Maybe I should call it. And that's how I got it back. But the point being that you know, I'm flying a plane, the motor died, and no one, nothing told me that the motor was dead. So it was an easy code change to the on-screen display to detect that the amps uh, were way low when the power was full. And now it displays a message saying, hey, your motor is dead. You should do something about it. Uh, so it was like you know, three or four lines of code, but it's really cool to be able to do that. Now, uh, I'm, as opposed to all the other people who've been talking to you, I'm actually not a liar. Uh, RC, that's what you picture when you see RC. RC is actually this, but with $100 bills. And actually, that's not. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's not even true, actually. Throwing $100 bills as paper airplanes is a more efficient way to spend your money than flying RC. Uh, so that was one of my planes. Um, there's those nice little batteries where uh, I think, yeah, that was a pilot error. That means I crashed into a light pole. Uh, the plane was, of course, damaged. Uh, I took it home. And then 10, 10 minutes later, while I was doing stuff, uh, the light pole softening light is not being touched or anything. It was just waiting to basically ignite when no one was watching. Uh, some people have had that happen in their car or their fridge. People have had fridge catch fire, which seems kind of weird. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, you put it in the fridge, by the way, because your batteries uh, are happier in the fridge because they're cooler and they don't degrade as quickly. That's one way to store them uh, until your fridge catches fire, that is. <laughs> uh, this one was a hardware bug. I had spent I don't know how many days doing this plane, and then the tail wasn't glued perfectly well. It was a very heavy plane. I pulled out of a dive, and the tail came out. And then the rest of the plane went forward towards the ground. Uh, now, there was such a hard crash. One SD card got cut like this. I don't know if you've ever seen this without using scissors. The other one looks perfect until you plug it in and it overheats and makes smoke. Um, so basically, <laughs> those were my two SD cards of video that I never got anything out of. Um, the LiPo was a bit shorter at the end. Um, strangely, those, as much as people tell you LiPos are dangerous, the newer ones actually have so many layers of protection. Well enough layers of protection, even though it was squished quite a bit, it actually never got, uh, never ignited, even though I kept it aside for quite a while. Uh, one of them I still use as a backup battery for just bench, uh, bench stuff. The other one, I think what happens, if you can see here, there's layers uh, of uh, what looks like um, aluminum foil. It's not quite that, but uh, it's supposed to stop the air from getting in. Uh, one of them got a small hole, so what happens, the air goes in slowly and reacts with lithium, and then that cell stops working. But I cut out the other cells. I was able to turn that four-cell LiPo into a three-cell LiPo, and it still works today. Don't do that, by the way. That's very stupid. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, another hardware bug. That was one of my newer planes. Uh, I was doing a high-speed test by having put a bigger motor, because I want to go fly at Burning Man, where there's a lot of wind. So I want to have twice the power than the maximum wind possible, and I did. But the wings were not quite designed to get attached at that speed. So while I was flying, uh, both wings kind of flew off on the side, the plane went forward, and then it went down. Uh, now, again, I was flying FPV, so that happened two kilometers away from where I was. But thanks to the FPV video, um, I was able to get the GPS coordinates of where it was. Normally, I have a radio on this that actually tells me how I am, but as you see, it got slightly unplugged because it went to a straight nosedive. So all the electronics actually worked, but they were not exactly connected anymore. So at least I got the electronics put into a new plane. That's the LiPo, by the way, which somehow you can see it's pancaked. It went straight into the ground, but did not catch fire either, which is amazing. All right. So um, that was my first Burning Man, in two, no, the first one that I brought an RC plane to um, with a bigger 2.6-meter glider. So that's, the, uh, that's running RD Pilot, of course, from uh, Trits Code. Uh, so I was flying from the ground using goggles, and I had the computer help me fly in case I lost video or anything unexpected happened, which at Burning Man it does. And remember, at Burning Man, safety is third. All right. 
So that's a very cool view from inside. You're actually not allowed to fly within Burning Man with the plane. I'm also a pilot, but I have to fly outside because they don't want you to fly over people for obvious reasons. Uh, RC at the time you could, uh, now you're not supposed to anymore. So it gave me some pretty cool shots. And I was able, even able to fly at night where I could not possibly see my plane, but using the goggles and I had something called an OSD like this, uh, I had effectively kind of instrument-like uh, view. You can see the artificial horizon line uh, sideways, so that shows I'm actually not flying straight. Uh, it shows you um, that I have 95% uh, of my uh, signal still being received, my battery, how much I used. Uh, here it shows that I have 13 degrees going down, um, 18 meters per minute of change. That's the power, 56, uh, 58%. My airspeed and my ground speed, because there's wind, of course. I can see there's wind behind me that's pushing me. Uh, those are the coordinates I use to go retrieve the plane when it has crashed. Um, and that's the flight length, six minutes. That's the altitude, and that's the altitude above the ground, 100 meters. All right, so then the next year, so that was the first year. I had, it was pretty good, but I did better. That was the plane that you saw crashed. Uh, the second version of it, uh, obviously, I made the wings actually stay on because it flies better with wings. Otherwise, I would be flying uh, drones. And um, that's what the plane looks like. Uh, it's a bit smaller. The good thing, too, is you, know, you don't want a huge, very heavy plane because if it crashes into something, it's less energy. It is foam, though, so worst case, you know, if it, this were to fall into your head, it would hurt. You would be very mad at me, but you'd still be alive to be mad at me, as opposed to a three kilogram drone falling through your head and probably sending you to the hospital or worse. So that's why I fly planes, even though they're a bit harder to fly. Um, so that's a, I got a really cool set of 4K videos uh, that gives you a shot, a um, few more shots, and at night it looks fantastic, or sunset in this case. So that was uh, basically all our new pilot. Um, compared to the amount of time that I spent doing all this and blood, sweat, and tears, you should totally do it if you have extra time and money. All right, so let's uh, continue with um, uh, Open Harbor Miniconf. Uh, the next year from there was a ESP plant. It was a way to monitor your plants, humidity, our soil moisture, and things like that. And uh, that probably wasn't my fault. No, it wasn't my fault then. But at this point, they, they added a NeoPixel ring on it because they had extra ports. Um, so I spent more time actually working on that uh, ring uh, than the rest of the project because I thought the lights were cool. Um, and that's what actually start, got me started with NeoPixels. So the next year was IOTUS. Um, it was honestly one of being the coolest uh, project we made because it was basically a small computer with a screen, full input output. Um, the big problem is it was missing pretty much all the drivers or most of them. Um, so I have that picture that I keep showing about those nice friendly people uh, who uh, trusted us with a new project and said, oh, it would almost work if I only wrote this and then about 100 hours worth of uh, drivers later, it did. Um, so those were all the drivers that I ended up writing for it and by writing I was able to port some. Of course, I didn't have to write everything from scratch. Um, and then uh, it looked like that. So you could actually use the touch screen to uh, write your name. The two pixels you see are actually NeoPixel. Oh, no, they're not. They're APA 102s, which are similar to uh, what we know as NeoPixels. Um, and I was able to make uh, yeah, a little menu system using Adafruit GFX again, um, using the same primitives. And then there's a few demos running from it. Um, this one, in the process, uh, at the library did not have anything to show color debate maps, so I, I contributed code uh, to do that, which after a couple of years of uh, asking nicely got in. Uh, that, that was a, I, that was in uh, Ballard, sorry, not Ballard, that was in Tasmania, so that's why we have a little Tasmanian devil. And uh, as I keep telling people, great programmers program and better programmers steal. So I found all that code on the internet and I was able to port it without uh, spending too much effort rewriting yet another version of Breakout or Tetris. So if you are interested in you know, how drivers work or just seeing a library, um, or if you have an ESP32, uh, W Rover, which is this reference board you can get. Um, I put in my demo to it, even though it's actually lesser hardware, which is kind of sad than the one we got from, uh, from uh, the Miniconf. All right, so this is probably time to talk about uh, blinking lights, because of course I do have blinking lights. So I'll turn them on. All right. So I'll make sure these work by me. So they come on. Yeah, there we go. All right. So very quick, so those are the, 
so-called NeoPixels. There are uh, four screens of 1616 that are tied together. Uh, those two are RGB panels, which are a completely different technology. They, uh, so just to give you an example, the NeoPixels are being run by those two wires, and one of them is ground. It doesn't take a whole lot, right? Um, these ones, I'm not going to go into details of how complicated they are, but basically there's no smarts in them. You have to keep refreshing them, and you get colors by turning the same color on and off very quickly, like the little matrix that I had originally. Uh, and you do row scans every eight rows, 16 rows, or 32 rows. Um, the wiring is actually, I think there's actually 14 wires, um, and they're daisy chained. And the more of them you add, the slower it gets because you have to keep pushing pixels into the other ones. Um, because I'm not smart, I actually do my own firmware proto boards like these. Uh, so you, can, you don't need a soldering iron, you can just plug things into a little board and at least got things working. So uh, NeoMetrix is something that Adafruit wrote. Uh, at the time, the idea was to tile again those matrices to make a bigger one. It, when you look at it, so well, how hard is it? Right? You have a pixel, pixel 1, pixel 16, pixel 32. But actually, no, the pixels are in serpentine, and they're going down like this. And when you hit this pixel, that board is finished. Then you go to the next board, which is here, and then you do it again. So basically mapping one number to, uh, from an XY coordinate to a pixel number, because it's all one big row, is actually non-trivial. So that's what Adafruit did for every orientation of the panels that you can think of. So they did that for the uh, Adafruit driver. Um, so that's kind of some demos you can see here that I did. Um, I made my own 24-24 uh, matrix using uh, strips. And it was a lot of soldering, a lot of build, and that's why most people who are smart do not do this because you can just buy these guys nowadays, even if you have to do a bit of work to put them together. So that's the end result. Um, the RGB uh, panels are, as I said, those two guys, completely different driver. Adafruit one, wrote one for the older versions of them. Um, the newer ones actually uh, require a better driver from uh, called some smart matrix that I have a link to later. So I was able to reuse my draw RGB bitmap that I had done for the uh, IO touch board because same primitive, completely different backend, but it still works, right? That's the whole point of uh, Adafruit GFX. Oh, and by the way, uh, what I was also showing is that this is, again, completely different hardware, completely different driver, but same code. That's the great part. You just don't have to worry about what's in the back end. <laughs> All right, so you're wondering why I'm wearing that weird thing that looks kind of, uh, well, if you were there last night, you're not wondering. Uh, that's just a LiPo test that you're hearing. So, uh, yes, I, I don't have many friends. I am secure and shy. So I made a little bit of uh, a few LEDs uh, <laughs> on my shirt and pants. Uh, actually, I'll probably stand here so you can see better why I'm doing this. Even I'll turn the laptop so I can actually see what we're doing. Um, so I have a few versions of this. Um, I like to, yeah, do I, uh, I like being lit up. Uh, not this kind of lit up, although I like the, the box checking part. <laughs> I, I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so this is the kind of lit up that I like being. That's at Burning Man, as you can probably guess. Um, this is the first version of my shirt with uh, LEDs that are just um, not addressable. So all the LEDs are the same color and just pulses colors with a simple $5 uh, controller you can find. Um, that's what the shirt looks like. So I did my first power system. Um, you may actually recognize, if you pay attention, that's actually the crash LiPo from the first plane that you saw, that it still hasn't caught fire, so I'm still using it. Uh, <laughs> and that's the controller, one of these little guys here. Um, instead of using a LiPo, you can use those uh, slightly safer ba batteries here that have some protection on them um, and still give you a fair amount of power. And, you know, that's really just off-the-shelf uh, little voltmeters, amp meters, so I can see how much I have. That's an ESP8266, uh, which I got from a mini-conf here. Uh, I was meant to do something completely different, but hey, it's a computer, so you can, I can reprogram it. And that was originally doing uh, the patterns that you're seeing on the, the pants. And I did the same on, on the arms. So from there, uh, that was one, uh, one of the music events that I went to. I'm obviously not the, ones, uh, the only one to have lights, although those people I paid, and somehow I actually paid to get in, so I'm not that smart. Uh, maybe I'm just not uh, good looking enough, I'm not sure. Um, although there's other people who do uh, buy uh, if outfits that are pre-made. Five minutes. Oh, we're screwed. Okay, I'm going to have to go even faster. Uh, <laughs> five minutes, really? Okay. 
No, it's 2.30. Is that 2.30? 2.15? Ah, oh, crap. OK, I was counting wrong. Uh, all right. Um, all right, so I have some other things. So I'm going to keep going. So this is, uh, well, you, that's why you download the slides, so you can look at them later. So I'm going to skip through all of this. Uh, that's yet another uh, project we had here, Next Robot. Uh, so the shirt, the regular person would have been happy. Well, I thought, hey, can I do better? The answer is always yes. Uh, the bigger thing is I want to wash the shirt, so I have this panel that I can actually take off because there's only so much cologne I can, I can put, even as a French person. So eventually I did have to wash the shirt. Um, <laughs> Can you put a matrix? Yes, obviously. Um, so the pre matrix, those are actually uh, three matrices of uh, 8 by 32 that, again, are being tied together by a port of the Adafruit uh, Neo Matrix library that I did um, using the fast LED backend. And that is uh, this library here. Uh, why fast LED as opposed to the other one? You'll have to, have to read the slides because we're running kind of out of time. So this matrix that you're seeing is, oops, I don't have to point, but it's this guy here that you're being hypnotized by right now. Look in the center. Please give me all your money. Um, so the shirt, um, new pixels can be very bright. On full brightness, actually, they're using up to 60 amps. Uh, let me see if I can make it a bit brighter. Yeah, 60 amps is more than um, I have on, on that, because otherwise it will get a bit warm in places that are not convenient to me. Uh, <laughs> OK, I'll skip that. That's what the panel looks like in the back. There's multiple power injection points, because otherwise the trace on it is not big enough to actually pass all the power. So you just re-inject power in multiple places. Uh, NeoPixels are hungry. Uh, you don't have to run in full power. That's the good news. Those are running off USB. Um, I think like maybe 2 amp USB, so it's not terrible. Um, I have here, uh, that looks what's in the, my fanny pack right now which I'm told is not what you call them here. <laughs> uh, so those are 160 watt hour worth of uh, batteries. That's a 10 amp power converter. Those are different uh, monitors showing how much power I'm using. So that's the shirt that you're looking at right now. Uh, that's EDC uh, Electronic Daily uh, Festival uh, Carnival uh, last year. Um, so yes, more people uh, taking pictures. So the top questions uh, that I get all the time say, where do you, where do you buy it? The answer is I didn't. Uh, can I have one? The answer is no. Uh, or build it yourself. Uh, you should sell this absolutely not, because if I do, you'll have one too. Uh, how much did it cost? Then the answer is about 400 bucks uh, plus a bunch of time. And is it hot? Uh, not really. That's the good news. The shirt is actually hotter than uh, what's on it. So am I done? Well, yes, although quite. I want to add an uh, animated matrix that I found from a different library, so I was able to port it. Um, let's see if I go through enough. Yeah, exactly, you can see these guys. Uh, so am I done now? Well, almost getting closer. Um, so this has been good. It's been, I've used it for about a year. Um, oh, yes, it's more. There's always more. So I, someone gave me 4,096 LEDs. Uh, so I was like, well, great, thank you. Now I have a month, uh, sorry, a week's worth of my time that went down to gluing them and building a full uh, 4,096 LED panel. Uh, that's an 80-watt power supply. You see to just do half of it, so 160 watts. I'm sorry, 160 amps to run that. That's why it has a very thick wire. Uh, that's only half power on a half panel. <laughs> uh, that's what it looks like. So actually, uh, the size of this panel is the exact same size in pixels as this little tiny guy in the middle. And that's why I'm actually switching to these. So the three panels that you see in there, if you rotate them in your head, they will fit here, hopefully, when I'm done with them. I just got that working a week ago uh, by running the driver. So that's my big uh, panel for Burning Man. Um, that shows a uh, very uh, good soldering that I did with no solder iron at all, and it survived one uh, week's worth of uh, plier dust. Uh, I'm not the only guy who, did, who had LEDs. People definitely put strips, so those are a few other people that I found. Uh, most people just had uh, lines. No one actually did a matrix yet, but now that I've seen mine, they're probably going to try to do one, so I have to be one ahead, so it's a never-ending game. Uh, <laughs> I have to say that, you know, someone stopped me and stopped the whole crowd and said, this guy won Bernie, man. So I go, that's so funny. But actually, I thought this one did. He had his shirt was not as thick as mine, but it looked really cool. So, all right. So I think that's yeah. I'm gonna have to keep going. That's my clue driver. So we're talking about how I reuse my code with yet another backend. So the backend I wrote for this guy allows me to reuse all the code I had for this, even though they're completely different backends of yet another driver. So I don't have to keep rewriting code. Again, bunch of links that you can see. So the uh, little panel you see is the one you see over there, just for size. All right, I did promise I was going to talk about Fuchsia, so I have two minutes to do that. I'm catching up. <laughs> so 
but this is not a Fuchsia talk, but Fuchsia is the new operating system that we are writing at Google for some of our hardware. Uh, it's open source, BSD, written from scratch. Uh, it has an ABI, so you can have, if you're stuck with binary drivers, which sometimes happens from some vendors I will not name, um, you can hopefully upgrade a kernel without being stuck with the same version of the kernel. Um, so I'm doing hardware testing for Fuchsia. Uh, one of the platforms was HiKey 960. Um, the one of the problems, it was dual powered. It wasn't really meant to be rebooted. Um, and when you do hardware testing, sometimes you crash the board. So uh, to reboot the board in this case, I had to do something very simple. So I'm going to do the slide so quickly, but basically I used the uh, small Arduino as a PDU, a power distribution unit that you can toggle ports on and off, uh, except for the gray wiring, because my thing wasn't big enough, but just to show you what it looks like, this is basically a, a bunch of uh, relays that are connected to a very small Arduino right here for scale. Um, and basically for 30 bucks or so, I got a 16 port PDU, which would otherwise cost like three or $400. And I don't have to use like all the power breaks that go from 120 to 12 volts. I just have one big 12 volt power break, um, which yeah, it's too much wiring to see, but I basically splice the wire um, and multiply it so it goes to the USB hubs on each side and then each device going through the uh, relays. So just one power supply for the entire thing and then you can just toggle the ports to a serial port. Again, I mean, anyone here would be saying, oh my God, this is so boring. Yes, it is, it's very simple code. It's like, you know, it took me 20 or 30 lines of code to write that, but the idea is you, you know, just a tiny bit of knowledge of microcontrollers, you can actually do stuff like that at work without having to use off the shelf solutions that are bigger and more expensive. Um, the next last platform I had to work with is a CADAS Vim 2. I just have to put a plug for that company that's uh, really, a uh, great vendor to work with. Um, they were actually able to modify the hardware to support a wake online reboot packet. So when you do a wake online, instead of waking up the board, it actually reboots it when it's crashed. So I didn't have to do anything to actually toggle power on it. However, um, one minute, ah, ah, and uh, <laughs> so uh, all I had to do in this case was even simpler. I, this looks a bit better because I, I was kind of ashamed of the first one. Um, Basically, I have one big power supply, which you can see in this corner here, which gets multiplied. It goes to a big 16 port hub. One is for uh, the serial ports. Uh, sorry, those are the serial ports. Sadly, the cables are a bit too long, but uh, that way I get serial console. Those are the fast boot ports to actually uh, send new firmware. The switch is also conveniently uh, 12 volts. So I only have a single power supply for the entire thing, and I only have one Ethernet port coming out, uh, two USB cables, one power cord, and then it's all self-contained. Um, so again, none of this is rocket science, but the idea is without touching a soldering iron or you know, being as smart as John and people who actually design boards and lay them out, you can still do useful stuff. So, oh my God, I almost got there. Uh, so programming is fun. Uh, even if you're not smart, I just said that, you can still do useful things. I don't like drawings are messy, please avoid them. But if you have to, a bit of knowledge sometimes can come in handy and build something and have fun. And no time for questions, but grab me outside. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you.